Hello, greetings and welcome to National Invasive Species Awareness Week, powered by the North American Invasive Species Management Association. My name is Elizabeth Brown, and I am your Legislative Affairs, Professional Development, and Certified Weed-Free Products Program Manager here at NASMA. I am delighted to have you with us today for the fifth and final webinar in this week's NISA series, titled, Show Me the Money. Many thanks to the Weed Science Society of America for being an outreach level sponsor for NISA this year. NISA is an international event to raise awareness about invasive species, the threats they pose, and what can be done to prevent their spread. Representatives from local, state, and federal organizations uh, normally gather with non-governmental organizations and private industry to discuss legislation, policies, and improvements that can be made to prevent and manage invasive species. We are concluding an outstanding week of daily webinars today, and I hope you took advantage of the resource toolkit that is available on nisa.org for your use. Now, for those of you that don't know NASMA well, I'm just gonna share a few things about us before we get started with today's presentation. So here at NASMA, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. A little bit about what we do, education and advocacy. Here, National Invasive Species Awareness Week in February and again in May each year. Our public facing outreach and awareness campaign is Play Clean Go. Please take a look at it at playcleango.org. We have uh, our Play Clean Go Awareness Week taking place in June this year, so stay tuned for that. We also promote international standards, such as our mapping standard and our certified weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. Professional development is a large part of our mission here at NASMA. We offer an invasive species manager certification program. We also offer free monthly webinars. The next one is on March 17th on non-native worms. So I hope that you will join us for that. And of course, our annual conference is always something that we look forward to every year. This year's annual conference is being held in Missoula, Montana, and is September 27th through 30th. We will also offer a hybrid virtual option for those people that are unable to travel. We have three different membership options here at NASMA. If you're not a current member, we hope that you will take a look at us and consider joining. We also have four partnership level opportunities, and we're happy to customize partnership options if you're interested in that. Our first Fridays is one of my favorite member benefits, and the next one is on March 5th at 10 a.m. Central. It is being hosted by our IDEA committee and is focused on inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. So we invite all of our members to participate, and if you're not a member, sign up and join us on March 5th. I also want to let you know that we do have a EDMAP Summit that we are uh, hosting with a ton of partners on March 31st and April 1st. So check that out on our website for more information and get involved with that. Okay, again, our uh, mission here at NASMA is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. We are grateful that you are here with us today. Let's get on with our main event. Okay, I am really excited about today's webinar and very grateful to have Lee Van Wyken with us today. Be sure to put any questions for Lee in the Q&A box. We will save all the questions till after the presentation and uh, we'll have a, a Q&A session after the slides. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce Lee Van Wyken, Executive Director of Science Policy with the Weed Science Society of America. Lee earned his master's degree and his PhD in weed science from the University of Wisconsin and Montana State University in 1998 and 2002, respectively. Following his graduate work, he worked for two members of Congress in Washington, D.C. on agricultural and environmental policy issues through a Congressional Science Fellowship. Since 2005, he has served as Executive Director of Science Policy for the Weed Science Society of America, the Aquatic Plant Management Society, and four regional weed science societies. 
His main responsibilities include working with federal agencies, Congress, and other non-governmental organizations to promote research, education, and awareness of weeds in managed and natural ecosystems. Lee is an active member of our legislative committee at NASMA. Thank you again, and uh, happy National Invasive Species Awareness Week. I'm glad it's Friday, a uh, very busy, productive week, and yes, there was a lot of uh, excellent webinars during the week. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, show me the money, and I'm not going to do my best uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. impersonation and dance around in my underwear, underwear. I'll spare you that, mercy. But I do want to talk about uh, where our federal money is right now within uh, the agencies and how we can go after the Senate appropriations and House appropriations uh, committees uh, to get that uh, money to the agencies. So here's just an overview um, of my talk. Oh, let me go back here. And on that, um, I'm just trying to it's, uh, block in my title. But anyways, uh, so the main uh, gist of this talk is the, uh, the middle part, which we're going to go through um, all the different uh, jurisdictions from the various uh, appropriations committees. Uh, their leaders and members. So uh, it's going to be a lot of slides we're going to uh, hammer through, but we will get through this uh, in time on a Friday. So first I want to start out, uh, I'll set this slide up. So we have the various uh, invasive species activities here, prevention, early detection, rapid response, control and management, research, restoration, education and public awareness, leadership, international cooperation, and then we're gonna build this slide out from the most dollars spent to the least dollars spent by agency. So here we have USDA and uh, funding in USDA uh, for invasive species activities goes to, uh, comes from ARS, APHIS, Economic Research Service, uh, NIFA, uh, NRCS, US Forest Service. I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with this, including the Office of the Chief Economist, which funds the uh, Office of Pest Management Programs that uh, many people don't realize or are aware of, and they're very uh, important to work with. Also, our uh, Department of Homeland Security is our second uh, biggest spender on invasive species activities. Of course, they fund customs and border protection, which of course used to be under um, USDA, under APHIS, but after 9-11, um, uh, that got put into Homeland Security. So those are the biggest two. Now we're gonna move out across the columns here um, from the next, the third most, which is Department of Defense. They're at 165 million. Uh, so it's quite a big drop off after we have a billion point four for USDA and 1.1 1 .1, uh, billion on, from Homeland Security, all in prevention. Uh, then we go to Department of Defense, which is mostly the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, it is the Army Corps of Engineers spending on the Civil Works Program. Uh, next in line is the Department of Interior. And that includes all the agencies that many of you are familiar with, including Bureau of Indian Affairs, BLM, uh, Reclamation, National Park Service, uh, Office of Insular Affairs, Office of the Secretary, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and USGS. So those agencies all contribute towards invasive species uh, management and activities. And again, we're going down the list here. So the fifth most is EPA, and that's solely through uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which EPA manages, and we'll discuss a little bit more. And this is it's a put in prevention here, uh, this funding line, but they do contribute to uh, multiple categories, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, but EPA doesn't do the accounting quite that way. And they also, some of that GLRI funding goes towards other departments as well. So, uh, but that's EPA is fifth on the list uh, for agencies that contribute towards invasive species funding. And then um, six and seventh are agencies that I admittedly do not do a lot of work in, Department of State and USAID, um, both dealing with international um, uh, threats and leadership, as well as uh, we see some, you know, a lot of research going on here. So uh, that is in a, a whole separate uh, committee authorizing or appropriations committee uh, uh, state and foreign affairs. Um, so that's, you know, I'm not going to touch on those any further today, but uh, certainly something we need to look into um, down the road. And then to finish this out, uh, so that was through seven, here's eight, nine, and 10. 
uh, Department of Commerce, which basically includes National uh, NOAA, Department of Transportation, and then NASA. And one thing, I'm not going to get into the transportation um, appropriations either, but uh, not to forget that there is an infrastructure bill that's being considered. Um, I'll work on that. And so that's an area that we can certainly improve upon um, to move it up, you know, from the ninth spot on this agency list of invasive species activities. And then if we look at the overall total here among the different um, activities, you know, prevention comes out on top, which is good to see, you know, also prevention is worth a pound of care. And we can have policy debates on uh, whether these other categories are getting the correct amounts. But this is where we're looking at. Uh, this is based on um, FY 2020 uh, dollars. All right, one other point about show me where the money is, is um, looking at this, so I'm a, you know, I'm a weed guy, land management guy, and uh, looking at this from a cost per acre basis. So, you know, here's our acres, uh, publicly, federally land, uh, federally managed acres in defense, 8.8 .8 million. And they're spending, you know, approximately 140 million. This is from 2020 numbers. And if you compute that out, dollars per acre, $15.91 for service. Uh, if you divide that by the total of USDA spending, you know, it comes out to $6.92 an acre. And then interior, um, of course, you know, bringing out the rear here at 26 cents an acre. So we can certainly uh, do better than that. And uh, to make, to push this point a step further, if we break out the agencies within interior that the three major federal land management agencies, fish and wildlife, uh, 89 million acres spending 35 million national park service almost 80 million spending 20 million and our largest land management agency 244 million acres blm spending 15 million dollars uh, on those acres six cents an acre so that's one of my take-home points is that we can do better than six cents an acre you can't even put gas in your lawnmower or buy a hole for six cents an acre and so you know one of my underlying points is that we have an extremely underfunded um, Department of Interior uh, for the lands that they manage. And, you know, these lands here, I mean, this is 413 million acres. That's almost a third of uh, the land in the country. So it's not quite a third, but it's getting up there. And then, so we need to do better at managing these lands. There is a cost for global trade. And I think I'm preaching to the choir when I uh, tell that to all of you on this conversation. All right, that's my, first point so here's the bulk of this so this is going to take a little bit to get into and uh there's about <laughs> 35 40 slides here going through all of these so we're going to try and power through this don't uh don't freak out if i'm skipping through things pretty fast and you can't take notes um, there's a lot of information packed in here and um, i'm sure elizabeth and bill will be able to post these online and you can go back and reference the slides but we want to get into uh, these four main appropriations committees um, and how all the invasive species spending is funded and some of the recommendations we're thinking about going forward. Here we go. Oh, and I had my boys do the homework on this last night. So I went through every member of the Appropriation Committee in the 117th Congress, all the new ones, and every state except Colorado, South Dakota, and Wyoming have a member on the House or Senate Appropriations Committee. So uh, those of you from Colorado, South Dakota, Wyoming, you can go home. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. You still have an important committee or senators and congressmen that we need their support as well. But uh, uh, try and be on the lookout for where, if you're from the state, you know, wherever you're living in, uh, where your uh, appropriators are, are coming from. So that's your homework assignment here in the next 30 slides. All right, here we go. Agriculture, rural development, FDA and related agencies. Uh, so it's pretty simple. Uh, the main point here, they fund agri you know, fund all USDA programs except for the Forest Service. So that's a take-home point. Forest Service is funded through Interior, and we'll get to that. All right, that was easy. Here we go. USDA funding. Okay, a couple points in this slide. One, here's what Congress gave APHIS last year for 2021. This is what APHIS is spending right now, $1.1 billion. Now, the lines below this are the subcategories um, within APHIS. And this is APHIS's discretion on how they determine these subcategories. And I think this is the only slide I put this in for. But 
you know, so within APHIS, there's three or four major programs. Plant health is one, animal health, um, you know, there's three or four of them. And then within animal plant health, there's egg quarantine inspection, which is separate from customs and border protection. Uh, there's pest detection, specialty crops, tree and wood pests, which we heard about, you know, many yesterday. And then there's also field crop and rangeland ecosystem pests, um, which is at $10.9 million this year. And 3 million of that fund from the previous year was taken out and put into this Kogan grass management pilot project, which is happens to be my background slide today, my weed of the week or weed of the day, Kogan grass. And it looks so pretty sitting back there behind me. And I, I was actually meeting with a, a house ag committee staffer yesterday. He's like, oh, that looks so peaceful out there. And we had a nice day. Like you should go sit out there. I'm like, that's an invasive, that's like one of our worst terrestrial federally listed noxious weeds out there, uh, Kogan grass, which is again, right here behind me. So yes, we're happy to see uh, some money uh, going towards Kogan grass management, which definitely helps uh, or definitely invades a lot of uh, the Southern forest lands in, in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina. All right, so that's APHIS. That's one recommendation. NRCS, $832 million. Uh, for the overall NRCS uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, eight million. Uh, so this is a recommendation. You know, eight million increase above FY21 enacted uh, levels for uh, Working Lands and Wildlife Program uh, targeting invasive species. So these are some of the uh, recommendations I pulled in from uh, the NASMA Legislative uh, Committee Working Group on, on looking at recommendations for funding levels for FY2022. Moving on, so these agencies are more near and dear to my heart since this is where I do most of my work on the research side with the weed science societies, but USDA ARS uh, gets one and a half billion. And we'd like to see all these numbers, of course, go up, but then from there, USDA ARS decides on how to spend that. And they have four uh, national program areas, uh, such as uh, animals, crops, food, nutrition, and within those program areas, they, you know, ARS decides how to spend uh, their appropriation from Congress. But Congress certainly puts in a lot of different directions and spending instructions on how they should do that. So these are some recommendations looking forward, uh, looking forward to uh, FY 2022. Uh, integrated control methods for cheatgrass eradication, which, of course, many of you are familiar with out west. And then also uh, this area-wide integrated pest management projects has not gotten a lot of attention, but it's been very successful on a lot of different um, insect and weed projects uh, focusing on this area-wide concept. And so it's been stuck at um, flat funding for uh, many years and we'd like to see that bump up. So, um, you know, some projects you might be familiar with were the uh, Team Leafy Spurge project. Uh, there's uh, Team Melaleuca was one. Uh, there's one going on now in the California Bay Delta on aquatic invasive weeds. Uh, so there's great, um, great results with that program. And there's no reason why we can't uh, grow that funding line. And then the same uh, within NIFA. So these are, again, specific line items within the appropriations bills that agriculture, rural development, FDA and related um, agency committees put in. And so we want to see increases in extension. I threw in the integrated activities accounts of this integrated and extension and research make up the three main components of NIFA. And it's very prescriptive. I think there's about 60 different line items uh, that describe how NIFA should spend its 1.6 billion. Uh, but it's also, you know, I, I tend to like that versus uh, point it into a black box, but we can have that debate for another day as well. Moving along. So here we go. So now we know what the Appropriations Committee is funding and the programs that we're looking at. So these are the, ch the new chair and ranking member. Actually, uh, uh, Sanford Bishop is uh, returning as the uh, House Ag Appropes Chair. So these are the subcommittees that sp focus specifically on USDA appropriations. Uh, so here's the House, and I'll show you the Senate in a couple slides. And then Jeff Fortenbury um, on the on the minority side ranking member. Now, I threw in uh, some committee staffers 
um, as a reference, but I encourage you to uh, talk to the congressman or call their office and find out you know, who's handling, handling those issues specifically. Um, and I will certainly uh, try and help too if you have questions, but uh, I just threw in some information here. Uh, if in doubt, uh, for the previous occupation put attorney, um, but we'll see that as we go through the other appropriations committees. All right, and then here is a list of the staff or the staffers, the members of the 117th House Ag Probes Subcommittee. So we have Georgia, Maryland, Wisconsin, Illinois, California, Minnesota, Florida, Texas, New York, Connecticut, and then Nebraska, Alabama, Maryland, California, Michigan, Washington, Texas. So if you're, even though they, you're from their state and you might not be in their district, most members of the House will meet with anyone from their state uh, as a possible con future constituent even. Uh, they might run for Senate or who knows what. So uh, when I worked up on the Hill, yeah, they would always take members um, or take meetings from anyone in their state as a constituent and they wanna hear from their constituents. So if you live in any of these states, uh, please reach out to these, uh, these congressmen. One other point on this slide, uh, Rosa DeLauro and Kay Granger will be on every House uh, subcommittee because they are the chair and, and ranking member. So they serve as ex officio members and they do have voting rights. All right, moving into the Senate side. So we have a new Ag Probes uh, subcommittee chairwoman, uh, Senator Baldwin from Wisconsin. And on the House side, uh, John Hoven, or I should say on the Senate ranking minority side, uh, Senator Hoven from uh, North Dakota. So they'll be handling the uh, Ag appropriations on the Senate side, and uh, Senator Baldwin gets the the award for the longest names uh, of staffers um, on the Senate Ag Probe Subcommittee. Hopefully, they're not listening, but uh, listening. Uh, anyways, here we go. Members of the Senate Ag Probe Subcommittee: Wisconsin, Oregon, California, Montana, Vermont, Hawaii, New Mexico. Um, you can read down the list here on the on the minority side. Um, I did highlight um, Senator Leahy here because he is the overall chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, I'm not quite sure how, so there, you'll notice there's an even split here between the minor, majority and minority, and that is because the Senate is evenly divided right now, 50-50. Um, but the, usually the, um, the chair and ranking member serve as ex officio members. In this case, um, Senator Leahy is a member of this appropriations subcommittee. And they, they do list Senator Shelby, the ranking member on this side, but I'm not sure if he has voting rights or not. And I was looking through the rules for the 117th Congress for Senate committee activity and I couldn't find them last night. So uh, I'm gonna stick with this list, but I just highlighted Senator Leahy because he is the overall Senate Appropriations Committee chair. All right, that was one out of four done. <laughs> um, hopefully this gets easier. So it's the same pattern now again. So here's Commerce, Justice, Science and Related Agencies. Um, they cover funding for NOAA, NASA and National Science Foundation. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, yes, NASA does invasive species related activities. And here's a couple. So within commerce, which is uh, title one of this uh, appropriations bill, uh, NOAA is funded at 5.4 billion. And then they specifically lay out, you know, operations research facilities within that ocean, coastal and Great Lakes research. And then specifically within that the National Sea Grant College program, which uh, is a uh, very important uh, aquatic research program and I forget the total number of programs I believe it's around 30 32 um, that are sea grant related to the Great Lakes and the, and the coastal states and so um, you know we'd like to see you know three million increase out of a 75 million dollar program it's not asking much uh, on in the science in title three of that bill uh, NASA is in there so over you know NASA budget 23 billion they have a science Directorate and within science, there's earth science, and then within that, um, looking at you know improved remote uh, sensing um, of invasive species. So, 
yeah, there's the invasive species appropriations are spread among many different appropriations committees. So here's the leaders in the in the house is Matt Cartwright, who's chair from Pennsylvania, and uh, Robert Adaholt, who just became ranking member from Alabama. Uh, he just moved over from agriculture probes and a little bit of information about them and then we have the majority and minority members so a little bit smaller committee again um, uh, representative deloro and, and granger are ex officio members voting members of all the house of probes subcommittees by the way which there is 12 of and so the the chair is known as the cardinal or they're cardinals of those um, appropriations committees and on the Senate side, it's um, Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire and Senator Moran from Kansas on the minority side for Commerce, Justice, and Science um, Appropriation Subcommittee. All right. I apologize for flipping through these a little bit quicker, but like I said, we'll get back. Um, these will be posted on the, on the NISA website, and you can go back and do some homework that way. Um, and then these are the members again, um, even split on the Senate side for commerce, justice, and science. So hopefully uh, most of you have already seen a member from your state appear on one of these lists, but we will get through them all. We might have to wait till the final overall appropriations committee roster. All right, moving third appropriations subcommittee in the House and Senate, energy and water development and related agencies. Uh, major component of this is U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which uh, I follow pretty closely for the Aquatic Plant Management Society. Also, the Bureau of Reclamation is funded in this appropriations bill as opposed to interior environment and related agencies. So that's the main takeaway. Army Corps of Engineers, Civil Works, and Bureau of Reclamation are in energy and water development appropriations. And I put in um, for the Bureau of Rec, uh, you know, they have one and a half billion dollars and I didn't list any specific projects uh, in the next slides, but I just, you know, that, that's more, the projects are focused on uh, different state activities. And so it's not um, as well defined in terms of what's going on in invasive species, unless if you put in specific appropriations requests for those projects within those states. And uh, we'll save that discussion for a later date. But within the Army Corps of Engineers, um, Civil, which is a $7.8 billion budget, and this, this program, Aquatic Plant Control Program, $25 million is buried in this $2.7 billion construction account within the Energy and Water Development Appropriations. And this might be one of the most specific invasive or relevant invasive species funding authorizations or appropriations um, in all of the appropriations bills because it goes directly to address prevention and research on invasive aquatic plants and also the um, boat inspection and decontamination uh, stations, which have been growing um, you know, in importance since 2014 or 16, I believe, when they, you know, the word of bill. So we're gonna discuss word of water resources development act. You can kind of view that. I, I'm viewing it as like the farm bill. So the farm bills every five years uh, these water bills are happening every two years, and it's a, a great thing uh, to draw attention to some invasive species issues. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. Again, so we're going to stick to this, but talk about what the 2020 WERDA Act authorized. So same information on top here, aquatic plant control program. But in the final appropriations bills that were passed on the House and um, Senate here in December and funding for 2021, which is ongoing right now, they included the 2020 WERDA legislation. And there was over $200 million of um, authorizations in there for invasive species work. And I put in a couple here. Uh, one is that they you know, bumped up the watercraft inspection and decontamination stations, uh, the level up to 130 million. And they included two more river basins. Uh, so that's great news. And then also they added in this entire, entirely new program um, targeting um, 
you know, these uh, five uh, river basins, mostly out west, you know, looking at uh, Russian olive and salt cedar um, eradication or, or management. Uh, so again, uh, my point with this slide is that these are authorized levels that happen in Word Up. Well, as we can see, this is the number that the House and Senate agreed upon for 2021, 25 million. And we have a long way to go to get to 200 million per year, which is what this Word of Bill just did. So, uh, and there's a couple other programs in here related to invasive species we don't have time to cover. But again, uh, these are authorizations and we need to move this APCP number up to 200 million eventually. That should be a goal because pretty much all of this money goes towards invasive species prevention and management. So who was in charge in the House on energy and water development? Uh, Marcy Kaptur from Ohio, great champion of Great Lakes funding for many years and one of the longest serving members in the House. And then Mike Simpson on the minority side and Representative Simpson has been a very big proponent of the watercraft inspection and decontamination stations. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, their leadership and great to see them both as chair and ranking member on this appropriation subcommittee for energy and water. And uh, Representative Simpson gets the unique occupation award for being a dentist. So good smile, Representative Simpson. All right. And then the members in the House, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, Ohio, Washington, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut. Hopefully you see a member from your state that you can contact. On the Senate side, Senator Feinstein is chairing the energy and water, the majority side, and uh, Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana is the ranking member on the minority side. One other thing about these staffers, so when you see a, a pro.senate.gov, for those of you not very familiar with that whole email classification, uh, these are act, you know, actual staff of the committee itself. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't make that point yet, but you know, the reason why I'm showing the chair and the ranking member specifically is because they're the ones that hire the staff that staff the, com the appropriations committees. They're, they're in charge, and especially the chair for setting the agenda and uh, initiatives that they want to cover. So they really drive the whole process and, uh, and the staff and their expertise are basically tied to the chair and ranking member on the appropriation subcommittees. And so they have a specific appropriate.senate.gov as opposed to if I show um, just a normal sen uh, the Senate staffer, that would be the name of the Senator like Feinstein.senate or Kennedy.senate. All right, enough on that. Here's the Senate minority members and majority members. And here we see Richard Shelby from Alabama as the ranking member of the overall appropriations committee. So here he's a member of this subcommittee, whereas on the other side, uh, Senator Leahy is uh, listed as ex officio, but I'm not sure if he's a, a voting member. All right. Last one here. How are we doing? Okay. Hanging in there. All right. So this is number 404 here. It's Friday afternoon. Interior environment and related agencies. And so a couple main points here. We already mentioned Bureau of Reclamation is not funded in interior appropriations. It's funded in energy and water. EPA, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, of course, is um, funded through this appropriations committee. And then all the money uh, for the US Forest Service comes through interior environment and related agencies. So the Forest Service uh, is authorized every five years in the, in the Farm Bill and re-up. So it's, you know, the authorizing language comes through the authorizing committee, the Agriculture Committee, House and Senate, but the appropriations comes through interior environment and related agencies. Very important note. Okay, so a few things here. Uh, EPA, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, was just also reauthorized. Uh, it was funded at $330 million this, uh, for 2021. Uh, we'd like to see that number get up to $375 million, and that was the number that uh, was just included in the, um, I don't know if that was in Word, but it was definitely in, in part of that 
big appropriations package that passed at the end of the year. So it's good to see that program in there. Lots of great invasive species work coming out of the GLRI. And then also the Forest Service, um, very large budget overall. But within, there's lots of different parts of that national forest system, state and private forestry. Uh, and so we'd like to see increases, um, of course, in each of these accounts. And so these are specified accounts uh, within interior environment and related agencies, appropriations bills, uh, directing uh, money towards these programs. Now, when we get into Department of Interior, overall interior is $13.7 billion. That's for everything in interior except for Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, what within there uh, specifically, so these are department-wide funds, uh, working capital fund, 60.7 million. And within that, uh, the funding is for the National Invasive Species Council and you know the recommendation to um, get an increase over the FY21 level to bring back ISAC, which many of you for, are familiar with, and we hope that that happens. Um, and so that is a, in the department-wide level spending. And the same with wildfire management. So this is separate from forest service funding that I just showed here. So this is a separate um, appropriations section within the interior environment and related agencies. But then when we go back here, there also is Department of Interior, uh, department-wide wildfire management funds. And then within that, there's fuel ma fuels management. There's also another sub-account in there, but I just listed these two for brevity. And we'd like to see, you know, that fuels management uh, funding, you know, some of that to be carried out towards, you know, the twin goals of reduced wildland fire risk and reduced distribution of invasive plants. Uh, and we, those need to happen in tandem. So this is department wide. And then I got two more slides here, looking specifically at the land management agencies. So BLM is 1.3 billion overall. Within that, there's management of land and natural resources. Within that, land resources. Under that, rangeland. So these are specified accounts, again, within the appropriations bill, within interior environment and related agencies. And so here is uh, one, you know, this is one I would personally like to see. You know, this is the six cents an acre figure for BLM, which is atrocious. Um, and, you know, I mean, it should be at a, <laughs> you could argue a dollar per acre, $10 per acre, what have you. But, you know, we can't just say, well, give us, you know, a billion dollars and, and we'll spend it. Uh, we need to build that infrastructure over time because that's, you know, not how the agencies operate. So a 10 million increase is certainly doable uh, within this rangeland account of 105 million. And I promised Elizabeth that I won't talk about wild horses and burrows, which is also within this land resources account and has seen its funding go from about 80 million to 105 million or 20 million or whatever. There's a lot of money for horses and burros that rangeland is competing with. And uh, I was joking earlier that we should make all those wild horses and burros, uh, put them to work with a saddle and uh, help us control all the uh, 79 million acres of invasive uh, weeds that are infested on BLM land. So anyway, that's that's another story too. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, 1.6 billion. Then that resource management, National Wildlife Refuge System, 503.8 million. And then within that sub account, refuge, wildlife and habitat management. So I'm, I'm just showing you some of the programs, of course, I'm not going to cover all of them. Uh, we'd be here for the rest of the, uh, the weekend, probably. But again, uh, invasive species strike teams, uh, which have been very successful, in my opinion, uh, to help the wildlife refuge system do early detection and rapid response, uh, we'd like to see those continue to uh, increase as they have been. And the last slide here, uh, specifically interior environment and related agencies. So National Park Service, 3.1 billion. Look at park management, two and a half billion resource stewardship within that account. You know, a lot of that work, we'd like to see help with states on board inspection and decontamination, especially out you know west with all the park service land. Also, uh, their invasive plant management teams, which, which used to be the exotic plant management teams, but now it's the invasive plant management teams. I'd like to see an increase there. And USGS, main research arm within Interior, and the Biological Threats and Invasive Species Research Program within 
the ecosystems account has a number of very good invasive species activities and research going on and we'd like to see um, that work continue uh, you know there's a lot of work you know, reading the western governors association emails this morning with the invasive species data mobilization program so there's lots of good research and uh, work that can be done there on prevention efforts and getting these standardized data sets okay who's running interior environment and related at house and senate and the house side Shelly Pingree just stepped into this role, um, and she is an interesting case. Uh, she's an organic farmer uh, from Maine and uh, very big on environmental issues. And so she could be very, uh, very good in this role as the uh, new chair for this committee. And then David Joyce from Ohio um, is also, you know, big on Great Lakes issues and so forth. So we have Maine and Ohio on the House side. And here's the staff, more Easterners on the majority side. On the minority side, it's almost um, all from the Western states, except for, of course, the ranking member. On the Senate side, Jeff Merkley just stepped in as the chair for Interior Environment and Related Agencies from Oregon. And so he's uh, very good on a lot of environment and uh, agriculture issues. Uh, and same with, uh, of course, Senator Mikowski from Alaska. So that's who's controlling the purse strings. Senate membership includes Oregon, California, Vermont, Rhode Island, Montana, Maryland, New Mexico, Alaska, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Mississippi, Tennessee, Florida. So overall, House of Probes Committee Chair, Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut, been around a long time, a lot of issues. And for the record, so here, the staffer I listed are on their personal staff and their in their office staff, not on the overall appropriations committee staff. So these are more specific to natural resource issues um, within their personal office. Hold on to yourself. Yep. I'm not going to read through all of these, but just to show you that the house overall, there's 12 different subcommittees. We just went through four of them and the house has 33 members in the majority and 26 in the minority. And so if you haven't seen your member on the appropriations committee yet, this is where they're at. So even if they're not on one of those four committees we discussed in the previous oodles of slides, they should be on here, unless if you're from Colorado, South Dakota, or Wyoming. All right. And just to be fair, on the Senate side, um, Senator Leahy is chair, and he is also Senate pro tem, mean, meaning he's fourth in line to the presidency. He's the longest serving member, been a senator since 1975. That's pretty amazing. And he's actually been very good on a lot of aquatic issues in particular. And uh, I think we'll hopefully see some very good funding lines on the aquatic side, having Senator Leahy in this position. And then on the, on the ranking member on the Republican side, we have Senator Shelby, who was in this role up until uh, January. And I know Senator Shelby is aware of Kogan grass in Alabama, which is the number one uh, state for the infestation of Kogan grass, which again is behind me. I'll leave it at that. And on the Senate side, they have, of course, again, even split 15 senators on each side on the overall appropriations committee. So this is your last chance. If you haven't seen your congressman or senator on one of these slides, that means you're from Colorado, South Dakota, or Wyoming. All right. So that's that. So we're pretty much wrapped up here. I'll just give you some advocacy tips and then I'll be happy to answer questions. So virtual meetings are the new norm and that has been an eye-opening year to say the least that kind of pried this door wide open now that we can go in and set up Zoom meetings or, or what have you and do them and every you know 20 minutes, a half an hour and you just keep clicking on the next link and you go to the next meeting. And the staffers are all amenable to that. Um, I mean, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. I haven't crossed the Potomac River in almost a year, which if you had told me that uh, a year ago, I'd have said you're nuts. But yeah, that's the world we live in now. So this is actually easier in some cases. Some of you traveling farther from the West, uh, you know, it's expensive to come here to D.C. to have a fly-in. But this is accepted now. Staffers are meeting um, very regularly via virtual meetings. So do your homework. Congress.gov has everything you ever need or wanted. 
all the public laws, the appropriations, all the members of Congress. That's a great resource. Um, you know, get to know your member. You're not going to find out all their staff. You're going to find out some of their staff that has all the connections to their websites. You can sign up for their newsletters. Get to know them. And then, you know, your meeting, of course, just like any normal meeting, try and get it, you know, a week or two in advance. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out just to the staff or meet with the staff. The congressmen, the senators are very busy and uh, have to be very specific about their time. But at least you have to contact the scheduler if you want to get to a meeting with the congressman or senator. Otherwise, the staffers are more than happy to meet. And they're the ones that are really doing the legwork and know the specifics on the issues for the most part. Of course, always introduce yourself. Be concise. I always try and stick to about three main points. Sometimes the discussion takes you other places, but three points in a half an hour is a very manageable and doable uh, goal. And that's what I try and stick to. And um, I always try and find my members that are from the district or constituents of the congressman or senator that we're going to meet with. And that is uh, very important. They want to hear from constituents and they will bend over backwards to give you the time. Just be honest. If you don't know, don't make it up. Because uh, once you lie and lose your credibility, well, then you're out the door too. And uh, that's very important. Um, you want to get back to them. So follow up with a thank you. I usually wait about a week and then it kind of gives them a nice refresher. And then if they've asked questions during the meeting or information that you didn't have, uh, try and re you know, get back to them with that information. And that is that. So again, uh, just to wrap up, you know, here's my rallying point, six cents per acre. You can't uh, even buy a hole and go hold your weeds for six cents an acre. And we had to do better than that. So um, I really uh, applaud uh, NASMA for trying to get a national coordinated effort um, during National Invasive Species Awareness Week. As you can see, there's many stakeholders, um, all tax invasive species. I mean, I didn't even cover, you know, a handful of um, some of the issues that are going on out there. And if we get all on the same page and have that unified message, it looks a lot better. It looks like there's a, you know, massive effort and it's a coordinated effort to help fix this problem. And there is an underfunding problem for invasive species. No question about that. Uh, if you can tie that into uh, climate change is certainly um, hot on the agenda, uh, wildfires, if you can tie your uh, uh, discussions into those topics and how um, it could help um, mediate uh, those issues, uh, that's even all the better. So I put my uh, email address and my cell phone up here. Uh, yeah, there's a ton of information we just flew through and I'm gonna uh, stop there and open it up for questions. So uh, thank you again for bearing with me on this on a Friday afternoon. Okay, thank you so much, Lee. Oh my goodness. I hope everybody listening realizes the value of what was just presented. Uh, so much information, years of knowledge, and uh, to have it all in one slideshow in one place is pretty outstanding. So thank you so much, Lee. I know how much work went into this. We do have a number of questions here in the Q&A box for you. All right, so the first question is the 2020 funding uh, a downward or upward trend in funding, particularly with the USDA? It is upward or, or stable for the most part, yeah. Okay. Is the Department of Defense um, cost per acre based on DOD lands only or just Army Corps of Engineer projects? It is based on a Congressional Research Service report that said the Department of Defense manages 8.8 .8 million acres of land. So I think it's the uh, Army bases mostly. What is the approximate split between federal funding spent on terrestrial versus aquatic species? Is that something we know? Maybe we need to go back through the slides and get back to you. I, would, I could probably come up with an estimate, um, you know, but it's you know, so we have three trillion dollars is basically the number that we're looking at. So uh, we could probably go through and sort, you know, by category and uh, get that number. I don't know if if someone else knows that number and wants to shoot it in there. Um, I, I do know that 
between mandatory and discretionary funding. So we, I only talked about discretionary funding, which is about one third of the overall federal budget. Like there's mandatory spending, um, like social security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, even like uh, some smaller programs, like the organic uh, research initiative within USDA is a mandatory funded program. So they don't have to fight for their appropriations every year. It's authorized permanently that funding in the farm bill. Um, and that's, uh, you know, some of the points that, you know, Gary and others made yet yesterday and earlier in the week, you know, trying to find that permanent funding source, um, you know, maybe it's time we need to start looking at um, a mandatory authorization uh, where it says you're going to, you know, we, these invasive species are going to be here every year and we need that uh, assurance of, you know, continued uh, monitoring eradication edrr activities and so uh, we put in mandatory funding and that and that is possible you know we can do that in Werda. Uh, that's something we can discuss as we go forward thank you all right we have time for just one or two more questions how closely do you need to work with federal agencies if you are submitting an appropriation request under that agency say for a new prevention program under usda aphis is money added to their pot for a new project or does it get taken away from existing projects? So overall, we want to grow the pot. And I have, I'm sure, a number of colleagues that are on the phone. And uh, when we start uh, playing this game of taking away someone else's money to do my money, uh, that's that doesn't not good rules to play by here in D.C. So overall, we want to grow that pot of money. And... Um, so for APHIS at stake, you know, they, like I said, I think they get 1.5 billion there appropriated. So APHIS decides how to use that money in general, unless if, you know, Congress, the House or the Senate goes in and they both agree to specifically steer dollars towards an account. So like this Kogan grass behind me, like, you know, uh, the, the state foresters from the South got to Senator Shelby from Alabama and said, <laughs> we don't want this Kogan grass you know, in our forests, increasing fires, it's, you know, a shade tolerant species. It's on the federal Knox's weed list. And so, um, you know, Alabama and, and those states made sure that AFA specifically put in $3 million for this program. Now, uh, I know there's some agency folks on the call too, and I know they don't like to be being told how they should spend their money either, and, and rightfully so. So it's, um, I would encourage you to, you know, definitely bounce it off the agency uh, first. Um, and that's what I was doing earlier this week um, with thinking about something in the farm bill for 2023. And so do your homework, talk to the agencies, talk to the appropriators, um, the authorizers. I mean, you really have to do all of your homework to uh, really have a successful advocacy. You don't want to surprise anyone. Yeah. No, we do not. <laughs> Okay, last question, Lee. How effective are efforts to prevent the sale of invasive plants um, that are popular for landscaping? It is hard to see large budgets to fight invasive species when it is so easy to purchase invasive plants online. Well, and that's, uh, you know, an excellent point that Gary brought up yesterday too. Like, you know, so for the most part, we do have enough policies in place to do most of our invasive species work, but are we going to inspect our way out of some of these issues on that, you know, that's why we can't get the numbers from Custom and Border Protection because if they actually told us how few things they're able to inspect with their money, um, you know, everyone and their uncle probably from the international community would be sending in stuff. And everyone did send in stuff in July and August with the uh, unsolicited seed packets from China and wherever else, you know, and we just heard about two or 3,000 of those and Lord, now they went to every state and, you know, everyone, I mean, I, I got seed packets from one of my son's baseball moms. Like, hey, what's this? Lee, she knew I worked with, you know, weeds and stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's uh, some policy changes that we need to look at to try and prevent that. Because, yeah, you can pretty much, you can buy a lot of things online. And uh, the volume that comes in, we just don't, we're not going to inspect our way 
out of this right now. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to thank Lee for being here today and for the vast amount of information that he provided and actionable information. And being a Coloradan, I'm going to have to get with South Dakota and Wyoming and, uh, <laughs> and get in the game here. But real quick, before everybody leaves today, I just want wherever you are at in the world, please stand up and give a round of applause. Um, and celebrate Lee. We really do appreciate you. So many, many, many thanks uh, for you being here today. Oh, thank you to all the previous speakers too. It was excellent talks all week. So great job, Elizabeth, for your work. Thank you. Yeah, we've had an outstanding week and it has been a lot of fun and I have learned a lot. So I hope everybody else has too. Um, just a few ways to stay involved because while, while NISA this week is ending, um, the, the goal of advocacy and education and outreach never ends. So I invite you all, if you're not a NASMA member, to join NASMA, participate on our legislative committee or one of our other very dynamic committees. Um, help us plan NISA 2 in May, and we hope that we can get back to D.C. for February 2022. Uh, we do have a free monthly webinar series at NASMA, so please join us for that. Um, you can always, you know, it, it doesn't have to be NISA for you to inform your elected officials, um, whether they're at the local level, your city managers, your county commissioners, um, at the state level, or at the federal level. Um, so we do have that toolkit available, um, but you can always um, let them know as a constituent that invasive species is important to you. Um, please like us on Facebook at Invasive Species Week and at NASMA.org. Uh, go to our NISA.org site and sign up for alerts and reminders if you haven't already. And of course, we thank and welcome all sponsorships and donations. We are gearing up already for May and we are super, super excited. So give us a couple of weeks to get these recordings processed and posted and turn over our website. We hope that we'll be able to do local events. We will have our event map up on the website. So if there are local events going on to raise awareness or control and manage invasive species, please share them on the, on the website event map. The resource toolkit will remain available, and we do have a free webinar series that we are almost done scheduling, so I can tell you a little bit of a teaser what we have in store for you. We want to share information about climate change and invasive species. You've heard throughout this entire week that that's very important, as you know, from the new administration's priorities. We have the National Sea Grant Law Center scheduled to present the model legal framework for state ANS programs and creative resource solutions to share the new resource toolkit for ANS programs. Our Classical Biological Control Committee has put together an outstanding webinar with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USDA APHIS to teach us the whole process from start to finish in terms of how biological control agents get approved. I'm really excited about that one. We're partnering with the Aquatic Plant Management Society to share aquatic plant management priorities. We have an outstanding presenter from Virginia Tech going to share a state weed list comparative analysis that was recently published. And we will share an overview of the Western Weed Action Plan. So we are just so excited and we hope to stay connected with you between February and May, of course. And so in closing, I want to thank our NISA sponsors, of course, the Weed Science Society of America with their outreach sponsorship. We greatly appreciate it. Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission sponsored our Wednesday ANS webinar and Rocky Mountain Recreation Company joined us for the first time this year at the supporter level. So we thank you. We appreciate you. So in closing, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. 